بسم الله الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن والاه ثم أما بعد. Today we have باب التهذيب إن شاء الله. Uh, chapter on refinement. تهذيب is refinement. Uh, and this is one of the 100 chapters of كتاب منازل السائرين. By Imam Al Harawi, Rahimahullah Ta'ala. So the Imam said, Babu Tahzib, Kalallah Azza Jal, Falamma Afala, Kalala Uhibbul Afilin. Chapter on refinement, Allah Almighty said, But when it set, that's the star, when it set, He said, I like not those that disappear, or I like not those that set. لا أحب الآفلين. It's an interesting ayah, right? Because it doesn't talk about tahzib, it doesn't mention tahzib. But I think that he uh, used this ayah at the beginning of this chapter to tell you that tahzib is a constant process. It is not something that is done uh, at one time, or it is done occasionally. It is a constant process. N does not have a fool. The process itself should not have a fool. Should not stop or uh, cease uh, to be practiced at any point. Uh, or refinement should should not be stopped by the practitioner. And then he moved on to the definition of tahzib, and he said that tahzib, mehnatu arbab al bidayat, or the description of tahzib, he said that tahzib, mehnatu arbab al bidayat, refinement is the test of the beginners. Arbab al bidayat are the people of the beginners. It's arbab is plural of rab, rab is lord of, master of, owner of. So Arbab al-Bidayat means the people of the beginner uh, or the, begin the people of the beginnings or the beginners. And he said it is Mihnatu Ahl al-Bidayat, it is the test or the trial of the people of the be beginnings or the beginners, because it it is certainly uh, difficult. And tahzib it is basically to refine to refine your actions to refine your states and to refine your intentions, as the Sheikh will mention here. And that is extremely hard uh, for the beginners. But he says, وَهُوَ شَرِيعَةٌ مِنْ شَرَائِعَ الرِّيَاضَةِ وَهُوَ شَرِيعَةٌ مِنْ شَرَائِعَ الرِّيَاضَةِ However, it is a beaten path for the seasoned practitioners. For it is, you know, Sharia is the path to water, and this path is a paved path, delineated, demarcated path uh, to water. So once the beginners uh, reach a certain level of riyada, and riyada, we talked about riyada before. We said riyada means training, exercise, and training. And usually it is used in the context of sports training in, in our times. But in this context, we're talking about spiritual training, spiritual refinement. So he says that this is shari'at, min riyada It is a, beat, a, a beaten path uh, for the seasoned practitioners. Because they have gotten used to it. You know, in their bidayat, in their beginnings, they were fighting themselves to refine themselves. They have become, become used to it. You develop inertia, spiritual inertia, after uh, some point. You know, the habit gives you spiritual inertia. Certainly, the habit with the renewal of intentions will, uh, will make things easier for you. And then you have this momentum, you have this inertia. And then you can, you can carry on uh, the path. And then a sheikh, as he usually does, said, وَهُوَ عَلَى ثَلَاثِ دَرَجَاتِ And it is uh, three levels. It is three levels. الْأُولَى تَهْذِيبُ الْخِدْمَةِ The first daraja or level 
So the first is refinement of the service, whereby it does not become spoiled by ignorance. Uh, your service to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala needs to be refined. That is everything. That is basically your salah, your siyam, your hajj, uh, your kindness to the people, your uh, basically uh, taking care of your family. Every, everything is your service. Your service to Allah, your worship to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, your khidmah. Khidmah of the cause of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Certainly Allah does not need your khidmah, but this is your service of the cause of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this re requires continuous refinement. And like I said, focus on level one, because we're all the beginners, we are in level one. If we get to level two, that would be great. If we can re like basically work on level one to the point we, where we are approaching level two, or just looking at level two and starting to think about it, that would be excellent. But sometimes, like I said, the three levels overlap. So it is not distinctly three levels like you move from one. Sometimes you'll have to also, you know, because he, he divided the levels here into the refinement of service, refinement of hal, state, refinement of intentions, and yet, uh, and certainly you'll have to look at, at all of them simultaneously. But most of the time, if you just can't perfect the first level, you, you have done a great job. So when he talks about refinement of the surface, he starts by saying that it does not become spoiled by ignorance. And the emphasis here on knowledge is important because he will talk about knowledge. He will come back and talk about knowledge in a way that sounds a little bit surprising. You know, he'll be talking about not giving in to knowledge. And then we'll talk about what he means. But if you uh, do the cut and paste, uh, you know, type of reading, uh, or if you skip, and if you're not uh, basically a careful reader, you may, you know, come to that statement of Imam al Harawi, rahimahullah, uh, about not giving in to knowledge and be surprised and then misunderstand them. But he starts first by saying, Allah jahala, it does not become spoiled by ignorance. Because ignorance, ignorance will make you. Uh, uh, clueless when it comes to, you know, the differentiation. Differ you know, ignorance at one level will make you uh, unable to differentiate between haqq and batil, between truth and falsehood, between ta'a and ma'asiyya, the clear things, the very clear, obvious uh, things. Uh, you could be ignorant enough to not be able to tell ta'a from ma'asiyya, obedience from disobedience. You could be ignorant enough at a different level to not be able to tell of the greater good, you know, or khayrul khayrain, or sharrul shayrain, uh, the worst of the two evils, or the greater good. You may not be able to discern between the inferior and the superior at one point, and you may be sort of engaged in inferior uh, service when you should be, when you're being called to a superior service. Uh, and, and there are so many examples of this, like uh, you, we've probably talked about this before, but there are so many examples where people could be uh, engaged in uh, acts that are inferior, thinking that this, they're doing their best, uh, where the, while they're being called to that which is superior. And then the Shaykh Rahimahullah said, وَلَا يَشُوبَهَا عَادَةً Allah jahala, it does not become spoiled by ignorance. Wala and it does not become tainted by habit or habituation. And this is extremely important because like like we said, you have to break the routine. You have to break the mundane routine to revive the niyyah. Basically to, to elicit that internal thought. Why am I doing this? It, you know, sometimes it is not the what, it is not even the how, it is the why. Why am I doing it? Uh, because it has become a habit, but now I have to break the routine. And sometimes breaking the routine could take effort. And sometimes breaking the routine um, could mean complete change of direction. Could mean very tough decisions that you make. 
about your entire life, not just, you know, and, 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 and if, if you don't make them, then it, then you may not, you know, the road may not be uh, basically uh, made easy for you. The gates may not be opened for you if you don't make those tough decisions. And then you come back and say, why am I having difficulty? Why am I having, why am I too dry? What is wrong with me? Because you have been given an opportunity to make that decision or to make those decisions and you failed. You know, you're, you were too uh, uh, weak, too lazy, uh, too unwilling, too involved in that which, or too uh, basically engrossed in that which you are doing, uh, that you fail. If you look at someone like Imam al-Ghazali, uh, after becoming the most prominent, one of the most prominent, or the most prominent uh, scholar in Baghdad at age 30, 38, and he was basically the most prominent in this madrasa in Baghdad, he had in his halaqa, if you know who, who he had in his halaqa, like Sheikh Abu Hamad al Isfrayini, Abu Bakr bin al Arabi, uh, the great Maliki scholar Abu Bakr bin al Arabi, uh, he had uh, of the Hanbalis alone, he had Ibn Aqil, he had the Abu al Khattab, he had the Sheikh Abdul Qadr al Jilani, you know, himself sitting in his halaqa. These are the kinds of people that he had sitting in his halaqa. And at this point, he was about 38 years of age, he said, he asked himself, why am I doing this? Why am I here? What am I, like, why? Is it all for uh, self-interest, self-glory? Uh, you know, and then he had this, like, crisis where he basically was unable to, to teach. Because he, he just, he, he wanted, he said that he wanted to even teach once a week. But he had this crisis where he was completely, his tongue was tied. He was unable to speak. Because he really had this internal turmoil. Why am I doing all of this? And this is, you know, this is someone who is, is teaching Islamic sciences. This is someone who is most prominent in various Islamic sciences, you know, naqliya and aqliya, and teaching fiqh, and teaching usul, and, and so on. T teaching usul to the point that his sheikh, al-Juwayni, rahimahullah, was reported that his sheikh, al-Juwayni, said to him, dafantani hayyan, you, you, you know, you, you sort of, it means you buried me alive. Uh, when he presented a book to him in manhul in usul, he said to him, you, you buried me alive. Why didn't you wait until I die? You know, jokingly. So, 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 so that is the, per, you know, that, that's the person that we're talking about. And then he said to himself, after all of this, but why am I doing it? And, and certainly it is not like he never thought about the niyya. He never thought about ikhlas. No one ever told him. You know, he did not come across anyone in Baghdad at that time or in his hometown of Tuls or any place, no, no one, uh, basically. But, but, but he asked a more, like a truly sincere question, like I could be deceiving myself. And then he went on to his, um, basically, spiritual ex, you know, expedition or exploration uh, for 11 years. He left, he just left, and he didn't tell anyone where he was going. He actually told them he was going to Hajj or something. Uh, but he went to Sham, uh, and then eventually he made it to Hajj, but, uh, but he, he had his 11 years of reflection and seclusion uh, to figure out the why, and, and, and basically to purify the why, to make sure that I, when I go back, if I ever go back, uh, certainly I, I, you know, I, I don't, you know, I can't read his mind at that time, but he may have thought that I don't know if I'll go back. I don't, I don't know if I will ever go back uh, to basically my family, to my students, to my life in, in Baghdad. And it took him 11 years to make the decision to go back. And it is important that we, that we talk about these issues because sometimes the routine, the mundane routine, sort of overcomes uh, you know, our uh, lives. And it, it, the, 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 then we, we don't really uh, sincerely question the routine, question 
why we're doing what we're doing. Then Sheikh Al-Harawi Rahimahullah, Imam Al-Harawi Rahimahullah said, وَلَا يَقِفُوا عِنْدَهَا هِمَّةِ So part of Tahzeeb Al-Khidmah, to basically uh, refine your service, he said it's not spoiled by ignorance, it does not become tainted by habit, habituation. And then he said, وَلَا يَقِفُوا عِنْدَهَا هِمَّةِ It does not become the end goal of the resolve. So the himma does not stop you know, at, at your level of service. You're always questioning your level of service. You're always uh, doubting that this is, this is good, good enough. Uh, not just doubting, you're almost, you're almost always sure that this is not good enough, you know. Because good enough we means what? That their service is good enough for your Lord. That you're saying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this is good enough. And sometimes when you're content with yourself, that is what it means. Like when you say, you know, I, what, what else can I do? You know, I, I'm doing my best. You know, I grew up in Brooklyn and I made it all the way here. This is, the, you know, it is good that I am doing all of this. Look at all the people around me. Uh, and don't we say to ourselves sometimes this? You know, like, that means that you're content. And contentment means that you're saying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that's it, I, I am done. I am doing my best in your service. And that's extremely dangerous. That's, that's a form of ujb or self-conceit. And this is extremely dangerous. So the himma, your resolve, should not really stop at, or your service should not be the end goal of your resolve. Your resolve should always exceed your, your service. You should be always looking to improve your service and your worship, your ibadah. Then Sheikh Al Harawi Rahmahullah said, Adaraja Susaniya Tahzeeb al Hal, Wahua Allah Yajana Hal Halu ila ilm. The second refinement of the Hal or the refinement of the state, it is to not drift towards knowledge. Refinement of the Hal or refinement of your state. First is your service, second is your state. And then he says, the first thing he says is, Allah yajna hal hal ila ilm. To not drift towards knowledge. To not drift towards knowledge. Not drift towards knowledge is concerning, right? It, you know, if you read this, it means that he is basically talking about contention here between al hal and knowledge. And he's basically saying that al-hal should not drift towards knowledge. Like the, there is the difference, there is the distance between al-hal and knowledge, and al-hal should not drift towards knowledge. And uh, certainly you read this, and although the expression itself may look problematic, but that is the nature of these concise uh, statements. They look sometimes problematic. You cannot understand them in isolation from the life of the Imam al harawi the writings of the Imam al harawi So, is the Imam, you know, the Imam al harawi that you know from all the stations that we went through so far? We finished, uh, you know, one quarter of the book. Alhamdulillah. Uh, so, through all the stations that we went through before, do you think the Imam al harawi is asking you to basically neglect the knowledge of Sharia, the knowledge of the scriptures, or oppose the Sharia? No, absolutely not. But what it means here is that ilm, the ilm that he's talking about is the ilm that is about, you know, technicality, takalluf, or the ilm that uh, will make you cunning and deceitful, will make you take shortcuts. Because you could acquire knowledge and use this knowledge to, 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 to serve your own interests. Knowledge does have that flaw. In, you know, scholars have always talked to people about this. You acquire knowledge, and knowledge can make you, once you figure out that Twitter is not wajib, you, you regret the many years that you prayed with. Uh, and then you, you say to yourself, well, uh, or if you figure it out, I'm, I'm not saying that you, that you should figure it out, because it's still a controversial issue, and the Hanafis, they, they, they have the explicit implications of the hadith on, on their side, in fact, when it comes to it. 
So I'm not telling you, I'm not making tarjih here in a fiqhi uh, issue. Change it. Can you hear me in the back? You are able to hear me now? Okay. So I'm not making tarjih in a fiqhi issue, but, but then some people go through this. And, and knowledge also can, can let you, can, you, you learn about concessions, you learn about shortcuts, and some people could be very conning. And some people like could be, you know, you, you don't want to go. Like, some people feel that I do not want to go with the sheikh into a business partnership because they will know all the tricks and they will know all the shortcuts and they'll always be able to basically debate me in, in and out of things and uh, why should I, you know. And that is really scary because it means that many uh, of us are using knowledge in, in a completely uh, negative way. So that is the knowledge that the Sheikh is, is talking about. That, that your hal will not drift towards uh, knowledge. He's not talking about you know, countering the knowledge of the true uh, beneficial knowledge of the Sharia. Absolutely not. There is no contention between ilm and ma'rifa. Ilm is the knowledge of the exterior, and ma'rifa is the knowledge of the interior. You do not acquire ma'rifa without ilm. You do not acquire the knowledge of the interior without the knowledge of the exterior, as Imam Malik pointed out. You know, any, any haqiqah that is counter to the sharia is wasawus al shayateen as Sheikh Abdul Qadir al Jilani said, any haqiqah, any truth that is counter to the sharia is with the whispers of the devils. Uh, so keep, keep this in mind. But then, is there some, something other than knowledge? You know, other than the ilm of the sharia, other than the knowledge of the scriptures, other than al-ulum al-naqliya and al-ulum al-aqliya. Is there something that is al-ulum al-qalbiya, which is not naqliya, not aqliya, it is not the transmitted, it is not the rational. Is there the ulum al-qalbiya, the knowledge of the heart? Absolutely, and that is al-ma'rifa. You know, terminology of the Mashaikh. So, the, this Ma'rifa, and this Ma'rifa is acquired, and Sheikh Islam Taymiyyah himself uh, goes into, you know, uh, or explains the, 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 the Zawq and Al uh, Ilham, you know, as fairly as he usually does, like, you know, with, with uh, like his uh, immense knowledge and his sense of justice, you know, he's just even with uh, the, the sciences of Islam, with various concepts, he always finds excuses for people. Um, he, the excuses that he, the beautiful excuses that he finds for the mashayikh of the uh, tariq or the mashayikh or arbab al suluk uh, or the, the, the Sufi mashayikh. So he says that the zawq al ilham, the zawq is basically, you know, intuitive perception. And the ilham is uh, inspiration. It's a step lower from revelation. It's a step lower from wah. Well, ilham is not like wah. Ilham is not, you know, so, so you, is, ilham does not be, is not binding. Ilham is not uh, to be basically shared with the people as a form of revelation that, the, you know, this is what God told me. Because that connection between the heavens and the earth, that clear, you know, uh, connection between the heavens and the earth and the form of revelation is over. Uh, but, but, you know, after the Prophet ﷺ is over. So, but he is, uh, you know, but the, the point here is there is ilham and there is dawq. There is still some communication, a more subtle communication uh, between the divine and human beings. And that is the inspiration of the heart, which is a lower level for, uh, which is a, you know, a step lower from uh, revelation. I, I, I don't want to belittle the distance between uh, ilham and revelation. I don't want to be saying step lower from revelation to infer that there is a short distance. There is a huge gap. There is no way that you can compare the inspiration of the heart to Jibreel coming and talking to you and telling you God tells you such and such, speaking to you and telling you, uh, you know, recite, iqra, you know, read. 
th there is no way that we compare these. But ilham is true. And zawq, which is the intuitive perception, is true. But ilham and zawq that we are talking about here are not counter to the sharia. They do not counter the knowledge of sharia. They do not counter the Qur'an and the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. And if they do, like Sheikh Abdul Qadir said, whispers of the devils. If they do, whispers of the devils. But they complement. They, they, they don't substitute. They're not alternative to the sharia. They complement the sharia. This is the knowledge that, you acquire, that your heart acquires to basically guide you concerning more subtle decisions, decisions in your life. How, how often do you listen? How often do you ask the mashayikh, halal, haram, and the mashayikh tell you this is halal or haram, or they disagree, and then you still need to figure out what should I do? And even if they tell you halal, does it necessarily mean that it is good? You know, because that is where we have to make these distinctions. Sheikh, one of the Mashayikh from Ansar Sunnah from Egypt, Sheikh Safwa Nuruddin, Rahimahullah, uh, like a student came to him one day and said to him, you know, my father is irritated by my beard, and uh, we're fighting all day, and he's becoming very sort of like vicious. Can I run away from home? Uh, and then, yeah, some sheikh may have told them, your father is absolutely, you know, out of my, his mind. The beard is an obligation. The prophet said, and, and he would not be, you know, he would be, he would be wrong, but, but, but what he's saying is not wrong. Yes, the prophet said, you know, grow your beards. It is the, you know, it is established. Uh, it is, uh, you know, an obligation according to the vast majority of scholars. Uh, Sunnah according to the others. So, but at the end of the day, the Sheikh would would not be correct. Like you, you can cut and paste this and say that the Sheikh was talking about the beard and this is the ruling that he gave. But Sheikh Safat Rahmanullah said to him, "Your father only the only change that your father saw on you after your iltizam, after you became more practicing." is the hair on your face. And he doesn't like the hair on your face. Had he seen positive change in your conduct, in your manners, in your character, he would have been accepting. He would have tolerated this. He would have swallowed it. You know, even if he's not particularly you know, fond of, your, of the hair on your face, he would have still accepted it because he had seen a change in your behavior, you know, positive change in your behavior. And that would be the correct, like that, so the Sheikh here received the ilham, you know. He does have the knowledge of the Sharia. He's not countering the knowledge of the Sharia. Did he say to him, the beard is not the sunnah of the Prophet وسلم, and, and you're wrong about, you know, growing your beard? And he didn't say this to him, but he gave him the right answer. It needs zawq, it needs ilham, it needs someone to think in addition, to, with his heart, in addition to his uh, mind. So it is important that the knowledge, you know, is complemented by, uh, that the, the knowledge of the intellect is complemented by the knowledge of the heart and the ilham and al-zawq. And then Sheikh said, وَلَا يَخْضَعُ لِرَسْمِ And to not be captive to forms. So. The, you know, the hal, your state, uh, should not be captive to forms. And we talked about this several times before, so we will not dwell over it for too long. You know, forms versus meanings. The, you know, the forms, everything that we do is basically like the body. Uh, the meanings, purpose, uh, is the soul that you will breathe into this body. Your salah, your siyam, your zakah, your hajj, your charity, even your birr al-walidayn. Well, sometimes can, could be bar, could be nice to his father, you know, to, to get like an increase in his allowance. Or, so, so, you know, you never know what, what people are thinking. So uh, all of these are forms. It is the meanings, the purpose behind the form that will determine your state or your status. 
And then he said, well, I will tell you to Ila Hazd to not consider any egotistical interests. And that is clear, to not consider any egotistical interests, the interest, and it is clear and not clear at the same time, because at the end of the day, your salvation is an egotistical interest, but that you should consider. We're talking about egotistical interest that is counter to the, intre, to the, to the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to Allah's demands of you, to Allah's wants of you. That is the, these are the egotistical interests that you should crush. Anything that is counter to what he wants of you, or, ca or that will slow you down or distract you from that which he wants of you. And then, the third level is the refinement of the intention, and it is purifying it from the humiliation of compulsion. Refinement of intention. He said, purifying it from the humiliation of compulsion. Humiliation of compulsion is to, is to treat Allah, you, you know, I, I wrote this. Yeah, like, yes, he is your Lord. He's your master and you are his slave, but he's not your slave master. Is, is that obvious? You are his slave, he is your master, but he is not your slave master. He is your Lord. He is you, you are loving, merciful, compassionate Lord who is asking you to come closer to him, to confer you know, on you, to bestow on you his mercy, his compassion, his forgiveness. That is what he wants for you. So, Zul al ikrah is to, to basically be dealing with Allah from this angle. The angle of a slave, you know, afraid of his slave master. That is not how you should be dealing with Allah. And this, is, this should not be what defines your relationship with him subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, that humiliation of compulsion when you're always doing things because you are afraid of the punishment. You are afraid of the punishment. That, you know, that, that level of spirituality is very miserable. That is destituteness of spirituality. That is very miserable type of spirituality. And, and then it is very hard to maintain it. It is extremely hard to maintain it. Uh, but what defines you, what, what is basically the prevalent feeling, there is hope and fear for sure, but the prevalent feeling is love, the love of your Lord. Subhanahu wa ta'ala, and to think good of your Lord. Never die. Uh, none of you should ever die except while having good thoughts of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Having good thoughts of the vast mercy of Allah that will always uh, precede his uh, anger. Uh, so how do you do this? Sometimes you may, do, you may need to do this with uh, lightening your burden. If you feel that you're doing too much, and if you feel that you have, your nafs feels, you know, you have uh, demanded of your nafs that which is beyond its capacity, uh, then you lighten your burden. Uh, and sometimes there are certain, certain things that you may uh, give up. Certainly without neglecting the obligations, we're not talking about neglecting the obligations, we're not talking about trespassing the bounds of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, hudud or hurmat Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but we're talking about taking concessions uh, sometimes to lighten your burden so that your journey to him does not become a journey of compulsion, you know. You do not feel overwhelmed in your journey to him because it's a long journey. Like I said, you know, treat your nafs like a beast, uh, you know, of mount that will be accompanying you on a very, very long journey, and you know, drive it to Allah Subhanahu wa Taala with prudence. Mujahada does not necessarily mean. Uh, Ex or mujahada should not, in fact, mean excessiveness, should not mean imprudence. You do mujahada, you, you drive your nafs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and you ask more of your nafs, and you aspire for more, but again, take 
you know, uh, proper steps, take proper steps that you can handle, that your nafs can handle at this level of your iman. And then he says, after he says, tasfiyatuhu min zullil ikrah, purifying it from the humiliation of compulsion, he says, وَتَحَفُّذُهُ مِنْ مَرَضِ الْفُتُورِ And avoiding the flaws or the flaw of lethargy. تَحَفُّذُهُ مِنْ مَرَضِ الْفُتُورِ الفتور. Uh, Avoiding the flaw of lethargy. So, and, and basically that, that is also connected to the previous one. Uh, because in al ardan qata'a ala abqa, the one who will overwork his horse will not cover any distance and will not basically uh, keep his horse, uh, will not spare his horse. So it may, uh, uh, once you, you go through a shirra min al amal, in al kulli amal in shirra, as the Prophet said, wa kulli shirra in fatra. You know, for every action there is a time of zeal and followed by a time of fatra, lethargy, and who, whosoever uh, retreats in his fatra to my sunnah will be saved. Retreats in his fatra to my sunnah, to my way of moderation, and so on, will be saved. So do everything to, to keep yourself from this futur, from this you know, lethargy, lassitude. Uh, but when you go through it, because it is meant to happen, you are a human being, you cannot be consistent. That's the problem with us. That it is just like we go through phases, and that is why you should always stay vigilant, and you should always stay observant. Uh, you will go through the times of lethargy, but make sure that during the times of lethargy you're not neglecting the obligations, you're not trespassing the bounds of Allah, you're maintaining some of your awrad uh, or the, your basic awrad you need to maintain uh, so that you could recoup from this time of lethargy. Otherwise, if you allow yourself, if you just give in to the time of lethargy, some people do this, and and then they they they... they and you see this all the time, don't you? They, they would be practicing at a certain level, you know, and then all of a sudden they just fall off that step and they never go back. They never, and that is what is dangerous here. It is underst understandable that your curve will have ups and downs, you know, the flux. So you go through the ups and downs, understandable, but make sure that you are retreating to the way of the Prophet Sallallahu because if you do, you'll be able to recoup from that uh, lethargy. Keep, you know, don't trespass the bounds of Allah, okay, you know, don't neglect the obligations, maintain some of the awrad, some of the good things that you used to do, and maintain some of the, you know, particularly the heart softeners uh, are important to maintain during this time, because if your heart uh, becomes hard, then you may you never be able to rise from from this uh, hole. So maintain your the, the, the heart softeners. There is nothing better for the hearts than showing kind treatment or extending kindness to people. Uh, then he said, Nusratuhu, Nusrat al Qasd, ala munazaat al ilm. Supporting it, supporting the intention against the contentions of knowledge. Supporting the intentions against the contentions of knowledge. And then once, once again, we go back to the contentions of knowledge. We're not talking about the beneficial knowledge of Sharia. The beneficial knowledge of Sharia is the first thing that he stressed for you when he said, Allah yukhalijaha jahala. It does not become spoiled by ignorance. Uh, and, and jahala is certainly beyond jahl. It is, you know, being ignorant of your ignorance and, uh, or being also, uh, uh, it, it, it is also used for transgression. But it, is, it also includes that, uh, it, it also includes the uh, lack of knowledge of uh, the sharia, because the knowledge of the sharia is the basis of justice. So, 
the, the, what the contentions of knowledge here that the Sheikh is talking about is basically whenever knowledge uh, drives your intention away from Allah and knowledge has the capacity to do that. Uh, the Prophet ﷺ said the, the thing I fear for you the most is ulama asu, the, the, you know, scholars of e evil. Or, uh, and we know that, that the knowledge does have the capacity to basically uh, cause you to be delusional and uh, that does have the capacity to steer your niya away and to become very self-serving. Uh, yeah, um, so uh, that is the knowledge that the Sheikh is warning us from. It is never the beneficial knowledge of the Sharia that the Sheikh is always inviting us uh, to uphold.